people wear like mythical man month is somewhat dated in its references, so it's been through three editions, it's been updated some. But but some of it will sound or feel somewhat dated, and yet pretty much everything DeMarco and Lister talk about there is still true and extremely relevant. You can still find you know, contemporary blog posts, news articles, and so on that talk about issues that are addressed in PeopleWare. Case in point, uh, last year when Apple started moving into its new spaceship headquarters, there was a whole flurry of articles about the fact that a lot of software engineers were now going from offices to an open space uh, environment. And you had people saying, have they learned nothing? <laughs> this, this is such a move backwards. Uh, yes? It's hard to resist their telling us that you'll collab better. You don't, you don't need open space to collab. You just need comments areas where people can gather informally. Mostly what happens with open space, and we'll talk about that as we go in here, is that people distract you. They move. They talk, they make noise. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, well, we'll pass out, you know, those canceling headphones. It doesn't work. People still distract you. Uh, so let's talk about it. Somewhere, somewhere, a project is failing. Their statement here, which comes all the way back to their first edition, is I, I will, as, as someone who has been reviewing failing or failed projects for almost 25 years, this is a truism. It's almost never a technological issue. <coughs> it is almost always a, either a conceptual or sociological issue. By conceptual, I mean, in many cases, the project never should have been done in the first place. A maxim you will hear me say, which I have not, if I have not already said it here, from uh, the Art of Systems Architecting by Meyer and Repton, is that in architecting, we're starting a new software program. All the important mistakes are made the first day. That is so true. The very first day, the, the very first, we're going to do X, and they never stop to ask, can we do X? Should we do X? Is X the right product? Is X feasible with all the other constraints we have on us? And they start out by going for a project that in retrospect is not feasible. And I've talked about this. I've, I've testified in court about this. I, I did a case a couple years ago in New York, district court, where part of my testimony on this, this failed SAP implementation was this never should. The, 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 the vendor, it was, it was a uh, value-added retail, VR, someone who comes in and does the installation. So it wasn't SAP installing the software, it was a third-party company. Huh? Oh, SAP is a, uh, a big global enterprise resource planning software vendor out of Germany. One of the biggest software companies in the world. Uh, and also the source of a lot of failed projects. Uh, because it, it, well, I, I could talk in length this why ERP projects tend to fail. Uh, and it's not always because of software. It's very often because of the vendor and or the, uh, or the, the, the installer and or the customer. But in this case, a client wanted this installation done. And they let it up for bid. And Numbers may vary slightly, but to my recollection, they had 50, they basically sent the proposal, request for proposal to 15 companies who do SAP installation. 13 of them said, no thanks. <laughs> now it's 13 of them, including some big names, right off the bat said, no, you know, we're looking at what you're doing, we're looking at the constraints here, we're looking at what you're expecting. We don't think we have the expertise and or the knowledge to do this. So there are only two companies that actually bid. The company that won had an initial bid. Uh, 
and the, the customer was leaning toward the other company, so the company that went came in and lowered their cost. So they're doing a fixed price cost bid on a project in a very narrow, the, the, the customer was in a very narrow and specialized domain. <coughs> so very, which the vendor had no experience with. And yet they said, yeah, we'll do this for a fixed price, even though we've never done anything in your domain, even though we've lowered what we thought our estimates were. And with their initial review, they said, actually, the current software doesn't lend itself well to this at all. So here's the problem is that, as Mark and Lister say, even though the core problems in most software projects are sociological and conceptual, they're not managed that way. They're managed like shipbuilding efforts. You know, we just need so many tons of steel, and we're going to lay the keel, and we're going to build the ribs out, and we're going to do the bolts, and we're just going to build the whole thing. And, you know, if we lose some workers, we can get some other workers, and all just interchange. And this is why projects fail. Now, how many of you have worked on a project that you uh, either considered as failing or that you considered in retrospect as having failed? Anyone? Including homework. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> including the current one? No, including homework. Oh, including homework, yeah. Uh, what you got? I was, just, I was working on a personal project for quite some time, and I didn't really, I didn't take the time to plan it, but I should have. And so I just kept getting into hiccups along the way. I'm like, oh, shoot, I didn't even think about this. And rewriting a bunch of stuff until I just got to the point where it's too much work to continue, and so I just died. So. You would be surprised at how often that exact pattern occurs in multi-million dollar projects on a corporate scale, but exactly as you describe it. They get into it, they reach hiccups, you have your, you know, Reset, slip schedule, you know, slip schedule, reset, slip schedule pattern. Uh, the overall pattern I call the never ending story. And then it reaches a point where, and then you have sunk cost fallacy. Well, we've already spent $10 million on this project. Let's spend another five in another year because it might work. And after another $5 million in another year, they say, well, we spent $15 million on this project. Let's spend another five. At some point, someone says, no, no. We're pulling the plug. In the meantime, we've wasted years and millions of dollars. This happens all the time. Uh, management tends to see development like making fast food. Again, this gets to the interchangeable, interchangeable worker. You know, it's like, oh, all you really do, you got to have someone on the, the, the griddle and someone who's preparing the buns and someone who's worrying, you know, running the the. Uh, deep fryer for french fries, and we can swap people in and out, and just make it, and all we're trying to do is just crank out these cheeseburgers as fast as we can. Back to armor. A lot of exploration, a lot of invention. A lot of unavoidable time. The more novel and more valuable the software is, the more time you're gonna spend in false trails. And discovering, oh, this really doesn't solve it, or this doesn't work. Or this nifty idea we had, no one really wants to buy. Uh, how many of you ever go to the website, the Daily WTF? It's, it's, it is a fun, if somewhat depressing website, because basically it's horror stories out of IT. And a friend of mine just linked to one the other day that I, I read about a startup where the founder said, we're going to build an app that's going to do this. And we, you know, we're hiring some people. And the person writing it said, you know, you joined, it sounded great. And then three months into the project, the founder came back and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're doing something totally different. We're going to do this. And, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to get some money for it. They started work on that project. They went for another few months, and then the founder came back and said, no, we're not doing that. 
And then they, after about three or four course changes, this person said, okay, I'm out of here. Uh, in the meantime, they had gotten funded, they had burned through funding, and they did finally launch this, this, this start, finally launched a website basically that had zero traffic to it. So they had spent a year or two and millions of dollars and had nothing to show for it. Uh, <clears throat> now, bullet point here from this, is, and this isn't Stephen Covey here. Stephen Covey says we're too busy selling sharp and saw. This is the quote there was from the Mark One Lister. The average software developer doesn't own a single book on the subject of his or her work and hasn't even read one. That is sadly true. Again, as you get out of the industry, and you may have already discovered that those of you who are working, a lot of your fellow IT workers have never read a book that really deals on software engineering, IT project management, pitfalls of programming, skills of programming, and so on. It is why my emphasis in this class is on reading the material and why I will cheerfully give out, being recorded here, cheap and easy A's if you just read the material. Because <laughs> that's all I care about. If you know this stuff, then it, it's a bit like back when I was a teenager, scarily enough 50 years ago, uh, at church, my uh, young men's group leader, Bill Cook, was a police officer. And one Wednesday night for Mutual, he came in, had a little strainer, and put marijuana in it. And a lighter, and he lit it underneath, and just let the smoke sort of waft through this room full of young men who were wondering just what Brother Cook was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay, you all know, now know what marijuana smells like. He says, if you're picked up at a party where people are smoking marijuana, I will accept no excuses from you. You can't come back to me and say, well, I didn't know what they were doing. He says, because you know, you know what it smells like. That's basically what I'm doing here. <laughs> this, is a, this is the marijuana. It's like, when you smell this, when you smell this, you know what's going on. And you can take steps to to sort of protect yourself or wave your arms or whatever you feel you need to do. Any observations on your experience with <laughs> programmers being treated like interchangeable parts? Yeah. Um, I'm doing research right now with um, some people in the chemistry department. And they just have this software that they get, uh, they bring in CS students constantly. and. I was looking at it, and it's, it's garbage. <laughs> but they're, they're trying to build something similar to an already existing thing. That thing can run a task in about um, a couple hours. What we built runs in days. And, so, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, we'll just keep on bringing in new CS students. And they, they come, they stay for you know, a couple months, and they leave, and so. Oh man, yes, yes. <laughs> No, that, 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 that doesn't work. So, someday they will get someone bright enough with enough time to rewrite the whole thing. Say, we're throwing this out and just starting from scratch. Because yeah. ultimately, what you have is what Barry talked about in terms of software rot. Uh, yeah? As far as the treating as interchangeable parts, is the mistake being the, oh, well, this gear or this belt's broken, put it in, and then fire it up, and it's, it's just as good as before, if not better? Yeah. it's it's. Uh, the ignoring the, the they're ignoring a number of things. They're ignoring the differences in skills and aptitudes and talent. They're ignoring the loss of institutional information. Uh, when you're working on a program, domain knowledge. Yeah, well, not just domain, but knowledge of the software. Here's what we did, and here's what we didn't do, and these are the reasons why. Someone new comes in and has to pick up the software. They don't know what went into all those decisions. And they'll say, oh, well, you know what? We could do this, and this would really improve it. And they basically reinvent the flat tire, uh, to use one of my phrases. Uh, OK. 
Varco and Lister tend to be a bit sort of touchy feely or obscure. That's actually the name of a light out of a Billy Joel song. Yes? Why do you think that this conception exists? Because, well, because management wants predictability. Understandably. If you're, if you're building a house, the nice thing about civil engineering, we have centuries of civil engineering. We have thick books that talk about material strength and everything else. And so when you're making an estimate on building a building, you can say, okay, here's you know, the number of rooms we're having, here's the number of floors, here's the materials we're going to use, uh, here's you know, a standard estimate as far as how much drywall, how much wiring, how much pipes, and so on we need for every you know, room or every 100 square feet or whatever. And it's pretty easy to do a prediction. Now, it should be. You still have buildings that, that are late and way over budget, and usually they're buildings that are trying to do something novel. Uh, or contrary-wise, they're buildings that are trying to cut corners. Been very interesting. Uh, literally within sight of my front yard, there's there's a house across the street and one a half block down on a on a uh, right angle street that were started at just about the same time. And it's been fascinating to watch because the one right across the street has already moved into and the one down here is still under construction. And it had starts and stops and people were working on it for quite a while and frankly when they were both being framed, you know, I, I'm not the person to ask about construction. I almost, literally, almost went to shop in eighth grade. Like my shop teacher tried to figure out how I could walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I was so bad at shop. Anyway, but that said, I was struck because these two houses were being framed at the same time. And this one looked very solid and professional, and this one looked kind of cheap. <laughs> you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the uh, wood there just looked thinner. It didn't look like it was quite as well built. And uh, that said, we have vastly more experience in estimation of construction. But with software, once you get into that invention, once you get into armor, levels of ignorance, management doesn't like uncertainty. And so they keep looking for ways to try and uh, uh, make it all work. I assume you all watched my lecture on Medical Man Month, 16 through 19. Most important chapter there, well, two important chapters. First is 16 on no silver bullet. Silver bullets still exist today. I will probably go back and readdress that topic at some point here because it is still a major fallacy. Second most important one is I think chapter seven, no, chapter 18, which is his mythical man month after 20 years because it's a wonderful cheat sheet for the midterm. Uh, it's basically a detailed outline of mythical man month. So if you're saying, okay, I know Brooks said something about this, you go to chapter 18 and look through. Oh, he said this in chapter seven, so I'm gonna jump back to chapter seven. So, the, uh, the issue here, yes? So we aren't allowed to quote chapter 18 then? No, no, you can't quote chapter 18. You have to go back to one of the earlier chapters. So. No meta quotes here, no quotes from the table of contents. Uh, the point of this chapter is just there is still, to this day, this, this has been true, I've been in IT for 44 years, almost 45, 45 this fall. It's this notion of inherently, there's an inherent demand that you work overtime. There's an inherent demand to not have a good work-life balance. I've done two startups. I've worked 100 hour weeks. I know what it's like. Uh, there are things I probably wouldn't do if I had to do over again. But the point here is, and I've also been burned out. Uh, after my first startup, I was so burned out, I didn't program for, for I didn't work as a programmer for four years. Uh, and I was extremely fortunate that I had both writing and teaching to fall back on because I'm not sure I would have supported my family. Uh, 
So, something to keep in mind here is that you'll be made promises, you'll have the geek lottery dangled in front of you if you're going to a startup, and <coughs> the chances of actually winning the geek lottery are all things considered relatively small. Uh, you need to keep that in mind. Quality, quality, and this is this is a theme we've already talked about. We'll continue to talk about quality is what's done when there's time left over. This is counterproductive. An initial focus on quality. This this is why I think one of the most powerful things to come out of DevOps, CI/CD, and so on is the idea of uh, automated testing. <coughs> but even there, I have. Well, it was, I think, it's someone in here who raised that, uh, who brought up the issue about the automated test issues, and they keep changing the test suites, is that you? So, so, you know, it's not a panacea, it's not a guarantee given. You can still have bad testing with automated testing. Uh, the irony is that the more you focus on quality, the faster you deliver. And this is what I see time and again on the failed projects or failing projects I review, is that they shortchange a focus on quality and you end up with code that ranges anywhere from simply being poor to being septic, being infected. And you, when you get to septic code, <coughs> you basically, all you can do is throw it out and start over again. What the projects do is they keep trying to push forward, and the code is so bad and so unstable that they just can't get it ready for production. Anyone have observations on this from real life that you'd like to share? Uh, <clears throat> Parkinson's law. This is this is the idea, you know, time boxing is sort of like, okay, we're gonna time box because if we give you too much time, you're just gonna. You're just going to expand the work of what you're doing uh, to fill the time that you're given. So we're going to give you less time. Problem with that, and that's not a bad approach. I actually like time boxing, but I like time boxing because it forces you to drop features. If you're using time boxing to constrain features, it's what you guys are doing. By the way, I'm, I'm, one of the things I was most tickled about going through all of your requirements documents is how many of you almost all your teams said, here's what we're doing for the first demo, here's what we're doing for the second one. And here's stuff, here's, here's our stretch goals. <coughs> and what you're going to find in the next four weeks is some of the stuff for the first demo is going to get pushed to the second demo, and some of the stuff for the second demo is going to get pushed out to stretch goals. That is fine. That's how it should be. The proper approach to time boxing is not to reduce quality it is to reduce features and focus on those that you can deliver with acceptable levels of functionality, performance, and reliability for the time frame. Yeah? Doesn't stretch goals just end up being a list of things you won't do? Yeah. Or it's, a stuff, yeah. For, it's stuff for 1.0 or 1.1. 1 .1. uh, it's stuff for in, in this, whatever. In, 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 in this class, it's stuff you probably won't do. Except that, here's, and here's where stretch goals <coughs> Here's the subductive lure of stretch goals. Is that sometimes you'll, you'll write your stuff and you'll get to a point and you'll suddenly see, you know, we can actually add these three features pretty cheaply. It's like, yes, you did this. That's perfectly fine. That's, that's the syndrome I talked about, you know, where you write something and your manager or your friend or someone says, well, can you make it do X? And you say, yes, I can. And you sit down and you actually make it do X. Because it falls right out of everything else you've done. And then you say, can you make it do Y? And you say, oh, no. <laughs> I really can't, unless I have like three months. And they look at you like, what's wrong with you? You can do X, but you can't do Y. And the difference is you understand what you're working with. You understand the architecture, the design, you know what this stuff is, you know what naturally will fall out of the work you've done today, and what's going to require you to add all new stuff. <clears throat> Death march versus achievable goals. Oh, bad estimates tend to lower productivity. 
Do you all know what a death march is? Death march is a ter term for a project where the goals are impossible, everyone's working overtime, and you all just know this is going to fall off a cliff somewhere. It's not going to reach it. Uh, Ed Jordan, late Ed Jordan, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, wrote a book called Death March and actually did a second edition as well. It's a good book if you're looking for an extra credit book. <coughs> Death marches are highly demoralizing uh, because you know that what you're working on is, <coughs> just isn't going to happen and yet the, the uh, you know, upper management keeps snapping the whip and saying, yes, yes, we're going to force people to get stuff done. And then on top of that, they start adding management type things to keep you from programming. Yeah? I, other than secretly looking for a new place to work, <laughs> what should you do during your death march if you're in one? When I, well, I, I've already told the story of when I was at Eric and uh, they were proposing this new project, this new uh, uh, network management software for a, a telecom company. And I basically said, no, I don't sign up for this. This is, we don't even have an architecture yet. We don't know what we're doing. And wrote a, wrote a memo, which I sent around to upper management and the engineering managers and said, here are the 13 risks I identify. And as I said, I was told to shut up an architect. Uh, but you know, as a consultant, you're, 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 you feel free to do stuff. So about six to eight weeks later, I resurrected the same memo and sent it out again and pointed out that 12 of the 13 risks that I had identified two months earlier had come to pass. It's kind of like, guys, I know this stuff. I know what I'm talking about. It didn't necessarily win me any friends, uh, but I didn't care. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but that, what, what you want to do is, if, if you see the stuff, raise the issue and document it. That's really about all you can do. Now. Let me, <clears throat> this is a good segue, uh, and, and the problem of having talked to this class for several semesters is I can never remember now what you've heard from me and what you haven't said. So if you hear me repeat stuff, I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. But you probably didn't pay attention the first time. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there was a question on Quora some months ago. Someone said, what's, what's the single most important bit of career advice you've ever received that changed, you know, changed your career? And I said, there was a software development conference I went to, this was probably about 1995, and I was going mostly to technical tracks, but there was one, uh, one session that was on affecting change in your organization. Uh, the guy who gave the lesson he said, here's, here's our who was teaching the, the course, said, here is the uncomfortable truth. The only way to affect change in your organization is to go in every day prepared to be fired. He says, if you're not prepared to be fired, then, and he says, in some cases, you can't afford to be fired, in which case you have to live with what's happening there. But unless you're willing to raise the issues, and possibly have them come back and say, we don't want you here anymore. Uh, you're not going to do it. So what I have found in terms of, of stuff effective in making change, here's what you do. I've used this. This works. There's something that you feel needs to be changed. It's like, OK, <clears throat> I don't think we can accomplish feature X. We should either postpone it to a later release or drop it all again. That's, that's my you know, professional opinion. That's the issue I want to raise, because I think this is going to cause us to be late. So what I start doing is in one-on-one -on -one conversations with colleagues, with managers or whatever, I simply state that. I said, you know, I've been looking at this, and I really don't think we, we should, I think we should postpone or drop feature X because I think it's going to cause us to be late. And then I don't argue about it. You know, they say, oh, no, we think we should do it. It's like, OK. But you, I've made that statement. But you keep doing it. You keep finding different people to say that to. And what I found happens is they start saying it to each other. 
Someone will pick up, someone will agree with you. And someone else on their own will say, you know, I really don't think we should do future X. I think it's going to be this late. Oh, yeah, you know, I've been wondering about that myself. And, and you keep doing this, and either it, you know, the change gets made or not. And if the change gets made, then you go to the next item. Yeah, you know, I don't think we should do future Y either. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that has been, for me, the single most effective technique I have ever managed to use. I've used it as a consultant. <coughs> and as a consultant, I don't want to get fired at some point anyway. So I'm, I'm far more blunt. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> But <clears throat> I have used that, and that is the most you, you see that because if there is, if what you're saying actually is defensible, and my whole point is you don't defend it, you don't argue it, you don't debate about it, you just put it out there and leave it for people to assess the validity of your statement themselves. And if what you say is valid, people, once they have that idea in mind, will look at stuff from that context to say, oh yeah, you know, that feature X really is going to cause us problems. So if what you're saying is valid, <clears throat> it will take root. Unless, of course, upper management is stomping on it, in which case, you know, nothing's going to help that anyway. Uh, but that's how you affect change in an organization where you've got, you've got this. With, with the death march, if it's a true death march, frankly, Take care of yourself. Don't burn yourself out. Don't ruin your home life. Don't ruin your marriage. You know, don't abandon your kids. Uh, if they're not happy with it, they don't think you're working enough extra hours. It's not worth it. It really isn't. Okay, Laetrile. This is this is basically their silver bullet chapter. <laughs> uh, this is them talking about the same thing that uh, Brooks was talking about in No Silver Bullet. Uh, that there's some new trick, some new technology or methodology that's you know going to send productivity soaring 100, 200 percent. You know we're going to do functional programming with a modified agile methodology and uh, with you know living sleeping quarters at our, our thing, and this is going to increase productivity. Uh, the uh, or that you know, contrary-wise, that AI is going to replace developers. <coughs> when we get to accelerate, which is your next book after this one, you have some very real research-based analysis as to what helps and what doesn't in terms of improving productivity. One of the things you will find, though, with accelerate is that culture is a dominant factor. In other words, <clears throat> all the tools and techniques that accelerate don't help if you have the wrong management culture. And we'll talk about those. Uh, your people will work better if you put them under pressure. This is back to my late sister's comment. Don't they realize they're dealing with grown-ups? Uh, often they don't. There, there's just so many organizations, there's just this sort of gulf between engineering and management uh, that can be hard to bridge. And they're perpetually suspicious of engineering. Because a lot of what we do is, is magic. It's, it's kind of like the king and his wizard. And the king never fully trusts the wizard because he, he thinks the wizard may be shining him on and some stuff, or holding back, or you know, trying to leverage for more gold or whatever. And the wizard's like, no, this is all I can really do. And it is why, this is exactly why, the engineer's credo is under-promise and over-deliver. The worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do, is to over-promise. To make commitments, to accomplish things that you can't accomplish. Now the trick here is to know whether or not you're over-promising. What tends to come with age and experience is, is a greater humility and, frankly, a greater caution. You know, burn fingers. My experience at Pages, being a whole year late, 
profoundly shifted my attitude towards software development. Because I had a great track record up to that point. Suddenly I'm, you know, I'm chief architect of this project and we're a year late. And I had to rethink everything I thought I knew about software engineering, about team management, uh, and about project management. Any thoughts or comments, questions? <clears throat> Oh, let's do the, I think we're going to take our break after.